So let's start with what I really want to show you and that is debugging. Okay, so I'm gonna use this example and remember I want to prove you wrong that printing stuff is a nice way of debugging. Okay, so let's run this file. This is just like we had in JupyterLab already. Well, it doesn't print anything, so let's print the result of this here. And we're gonna see where well, first of all the bad, bad credentials. Um, so let me use a, an actual working key. So with a correct key, this is what I'm getting. A really, 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 really long string. So now I wanted to use, I wanted to somehow figure out the information in here. But with this string, what am I doing with this? I can't really do anything with this. This sucks. It's one long line, it's awful. I rather would like to look at this one line in a really nicely formatted way. And I can do this by, let's make, let's assign a variable to this and then have some content line afterwards. And now let's set a breakpoint here. Simply clicking here, I'm setting a breakpoint. And now let's click this debug button. A new window is gonna open here and that's the debug window. So now I'm in debug mode. We see that debug mode, now I have two tabs here in this debug tab. One is the console, which looks like your normal console when I use the RAN window, except there's no content printed here yet. And then I have more stuff here. But what we also see is that now in my source code, I am in the line where I set the breakpoint. And here I see I have some variables right here. So now my program, when until this breakpoint, and stopped or paused rather execution at this very point. And now I can do stuff at this point in the execution of my program. So I can, for example, in my variables here, which are the variables which, which are there in this code, I can look at this A and it's now really a lot nicer formatted. So what is debugging? Be debugging is basically the same as running except that I have breakpoints inside this. If I don't have any, it's very much the same. So if I stop the execution of this, didn't add a breakpoint, and now, well, uh, let me actually print for example A here, now it looks very much the same thing. So the debugging, this is the command it runs, so it has some PyCharm with its visual debugger, extracts, abstracts away the more complex function call for the debugger, but under the hood now, so it connects to the debugger here, and then I see my print, and then my process returns, looking basically just like in the, web, in the one window. So as soon as I don't, as, as long as I don't have any breakpoints, debugging looks just as running. But with this breakpoint now, if I debug, I stop, I pause execution right here. And visual debuggers are, so they're awesome. They're just not at all harder than a normal call. But I have breakpoints where I can stop execution at some point. Okay, so I have now my variable a equals request or JSON. And now if I can, for example, I can even click here and I can inspect this A and this is how it looks. And this is nicely formatted. I see that inside this, I have a list of dictionaries and I can open each of these dictionaries. Okay. Next to this variable window here, I also have the frames here. And what are frames? Well, frames are basically scopes of execution I'm in. So if I had this part of my code here in the function def some func, and then inside my code here, well, first of all, I had a normal main method, right? Main. And now inside my main, I called my function some func. So now if I have a breakpoint here, well, first of all, what I'm gonna see is, well, this doesn't work. What's my error? Oh, no call on here. Whoops. Uh, yeah. So now if I'm running it, I see I'm still breaking at the same point, but now I have more frames. And now my frames are, like I said, so the scopes of execution. If I have functions that call other functions, um, I'm basically, so, I'm having, a, I'm having a call stack. So when 
Python calls another function, this new function is going to be put on the call stack such that once I execute, so it's a stack, so it's always, I'm all, the interpreter is always at the innermost function, but it's going to know that the one it calls is in the stack just one element below that, and the one that called that is in the stack one element below that. So this here is my actual call stack. So I'm here in some func, and this some func is inside this main function, and this main function is inside this part of my module. What we see here is that there are no variables here because Python doesn't know of any variables here because the A is only existent inside the scope of this function. Same here. And here there is the A and also the author there because these two variables exist inside this function. And now as you see my authorization header here, I have to change it again. Um, so if I, for example, set a variable here b equals 2, I could now inside this frame b exists and inside this one neither exists and inside this one a exists. Okay, so and this is basically where you are. So, okay, inside the frames Python shows me what variables exist here in this frame. Okay, so now if I, so what I could also do, for example, I could set, so let me show you how to get around in the debugger. So I can make more than one breakpoint. Okay, and for now debug, I'm first waiting at the first breakpoint. I could continue my program, resume my program here. Now it's going to execute until the next breakpoint. And if I don't have any more breakpoints in there, and continue where my program is going to run through and now it's done it printed this stuff here. Okay, so how to get around. So this you can either, you can pause your program if at some point in execution, but you don't know where it is precisely. You can continue it, so it automatically pauses at breakpoints. I can continue at breakpoints, but what I can also do is I can step over, step and step into functions. So now here, if I hadn't, if I wouldn't have this breakpoint here, I could now select to either step into this function, and now if I do this, this is going to go into this function. Now if I step into this function, I'm going to step into this. Now there's no function I'm stepping into, so this here has not the same effect as stepping over. And I could now step into request.get, but now I would see that I'm somewhere in a file which I don't know. So this is not part of my project. So how do I know it? Well, PyCharm shows it to me in yellow here. And if I wanted to get out, I can step out of this. So now I'm again here. Instead of stepping into it, so I could just as well have used step into my code. So this would have only stepped into this function if it was part of this um, project of my code. So I could either do that or I could simply step over and now it gets over the line, getting to the next line. And using this step in and step over, you can go through your code line by line. So if I had the breakpoint at the very first position, so the very first position is the first line of my code, and I would start debugging here, I could, using step in and step over, I could go through my entire code. So now I'm stepping over this line, stepping over this line, step over this, step over this, and now I'm here, step over this, and now I want to step into my main function, yes. This calls another function, I want to step into this again. This I want to step over, this I want to step over, and I see as I'm gradually stepping through my code, the variables here are going to be added. And now if I stepped out of this function, I'm going to, I would be in this frame again. So I can still look at the stuff in this frame, and I could still, for example, here inside this, I could still look at B. And I could also, if I stepped out of this and out of this twice, I would again be here. So stepping out basically exits from the frame. So it simply takes the, unstacks the first element from my stack, my call stack, which are the frames here. All right. Okay, so now what I wanted to do is I wanted to figure out um, as you see here, I wanted to figure out how I can get this stuff here. And well, I know it's not in the JSON, so let me set my variable here to a equals this. 
Now let me make a breakpoint here such that I know what A is. And now, well, let's move the first breakpoint and continue. Now it's going to run into this breakpoint. Okay, and now A is response to 100. Yeah, that's like that I knew. But if I now look into A, I see there's more to it. There's much more to it. And I can navigate through this. What I can also do is here I can press evaluate expression, which I'm... And, and here I could, well, evaluate somewhere in the Python expression. I can have arbitrary Python code in here, like 1 plus 1. And now I hit evaluate and it's going to tell me the result is 2. I could also look at the variable I'm having here. So A is the result of this request thing. So I can look at this and now it shows me basically the same way as here. And I can look at, for example, so I wanted to look at this response and see where this result of the headers is. Now I'm seeing, ah, okay, this has a headers attribute. Okay, that's really nice. So let me show, let me look into this. Okay, mm -hmm, this looks rather complicated, but under this, ah, okay, mm -hmm, there's my x limit. This is where I wanted to get. So now inside this evaluate expression, I can go for, okay, uh -huh, it's apparently a at the position headers. Now I can try to run it. It tells me type error response object is not subscriptable. Hmm. Okay, so this was wrong, but you see it doesn't exit my program. I'm getting the type error inside this evaluate expression window, but this doesn't stop the evaluation of my, like the one of my entire program. So hmm, this apparently I cannot subscript it, but maybe I can do it like this. Ah, it actually works. Okay, so now a dot headers apparently what where I met. Now this here is a case insensitive dict. And inside this, there's somehow this underscore store. So a headers at the position underscore store. Hmm. Again, this doesn't work, but well, maybe I can again access it via dot access. Ah, okay, this works. Now inside this, this is an order dict. I know order dict, I can do the position x weight limit limit. Uh -huh. And then apparently it's at the first position. So now I'm finally at the place. So note that now that I logged in, I don't have 60, a limit of 60 per, per, per hour, but a 5,000 request per hour. This is why the value is now 5,000. Now I finally got the way of where this number here is hidden. So now I can make this an integer, check my value window if it still works, and now add this to my code. So print, let's not print A here, but let's print, well, let's first of all, um, make a variable, so x weight limit, so weight limit equals, and then this value, now we print weight limit, colon, and then my weight limit. So now, I would, now I have to stop my program again, because PyCharm, I, can, I can't add stuff to my file while it's running. I kinda can, I can live reload it, but, I normally don't do this, so in this case I would stop my program once I added the stuff here, and now I would simply try to run it again. Now you see, my x weight limit is actually 5000, now I can print it. And if I would have to try to get around in this without my program being still live and being still on and being still and still running while I have the chance to evaluate expressions I'm trying, where it can simply throw errors as often as I'd like, if I hadn't had this possibility, I would, ta it would have taken me ages to figure out how to access this here. But using the debugger, it's really fast because I can do this while my program is still running. So to continue with my example, what I wanted to do is, well, I wanted to check this limit GitHub gives me, which it does to stop me from, for example, DDoSing it, and to wait until, so if I reach this limit, or rather if my remaining, um, the remaining number of limits I have, uh, of, of requests I have, which decreases every call, that becomes zero, then I want to pause until I, the reset time, until I reach the reset time. Okay, so for this, I implemented a wrapper I want request, so from request, for original import requests. Um, and now in this class here, I have a requests wrapper and I'm exporting this, an instance of this request wrapper's request. And what this does, well, under the hood, it's simply whenever I call this here dot get, then it calls the 
imported request, but it also checks the X weight limit. Now what this is supposed to do, it's supposed to stop and pause for until the, I hit the reset time if my the remaining requests I'm having becomes zero. Okay, so let me make a breakpoint of this very function because I haven't implemented it yet. Okay, so if I now run this here, I'm going to stop at the first breakpoint, which is not this one, but this one. So now I wouldn't know where am I even, but I can simply check my call stack for that. So I'm in my module, I'm inside the main, I'm inside some func, and inside this I'm in this request.get, and this request.get is this request for original, so it's this very file here. Inside this, I'm inside this get, and inside this, I'm inside this check x weight limit. Okay, um, so I can simply navigate through the frames to understand where, where I am in my code. Okay, and now I'm having, so if I look at the variables here, well, I have the response object, yes, and I also have a self. And I see that self is an instance of type request wrapper. And if I here look at self, what I can even do is I can jump to the source, which is here, there's the self, the self is defined, and I can also jump to the type source where, uh, so this is where the variable is, and first was where the variable is, and this is where it's actually defined, so this is where the class is. Okay, so apparently, according to my uh, my call stack, I'm inside this here. And now in here, I would continue again. So I wanted to get all the headers. So what I can do is, and I figure that out after a bunch of trying out, of course, I figure out that this is a way of making the headers to a dictionary the way I know it. Okay, note that inside this evaluate window, um, dict compressions and uh, this dict comprehensions and list comprehensions don't always work precisely the way they do normally, because this is just of how the debugger works and how the locals and globals are in the debugger, but most of the time it works. <laughs> Sometimes it only works at the second execution. Okay, so now I could get the headers like this. So headers equals this. And then I could, for example, make a function. I could add this here. I would have to rerun afterwards because this is not executed. Um, and now I could, depending on, for example, if the x weight limit is in the headers, I could continue doing stuff. So could now execute this here, and now I would see now the headers exist as variable inside this one of my code. So if I would run it anew, that wouldn't exist because of this, but because I added the line here, right? And now I can simply run headers at the position x weight limit reset. Now this here is Unix time, and now I would have to figure out how to convert this Unix time to a normal time. And after a bunch of trying out, I would notice that um, this here actually gets the time. Um, so let me try this. And now I would see, aha, it resets in pretty much one hour. So actually I have to do this because another time zone. So now I could eventually, for example, make this here a lambda function time from headers, so just like this. So. I'm going fast o of, over all of this, but this is how I would go on implementing. And now I would have this function, and I would be able to take reset time, reset time equals, and then time from headers. And then I would have the headers here. And now I could, for example, add a new breakpoint here. And because I just added stuff, I have to run a new. So I'm starting to debug again, and now I'm checking if headers and reset time work. So I can look at them here. So headers, this looks like the headers I wanted to get, and the reset time also looks correct. And now we could continue with this stuff until I would eventually reach all of this code. Now this would do what I wanted. It would, if I hit my, so first of all, it would warn me if my remaining requests would become low, and if they become basically zero, I'm gonna sleep simply until I reach this limit again. Okay. And then I put all of this into a try accept block, and this is what I do oftentimes. So when I have an exception, which I really have only seldom, what I'm doing here is I make a try accept block around this, and I'm printing, or I'm just having one ran some random function inside the accept block, and I'm having this breakpoint inside the accept. So now, 
if the code runs through normally without any exception, well, if I wouldn't have this, if I wouldn't have this breakpoint, it would simply run through. And now my debugging looks just like my running. But if something would ever change and an edge case would occur, so for example, I would, I don't know, divide by zero inside here, so or something about the headers here would change, and if I would run debugging, then I would, ta-da, go into my exception here, and now I could check, okay, what was wrong? In this case, obviously, it's this, but generally I could do it. Okay. So this is what I do if I have an ex if I only want to step at one exception that happens once in a blue moon. However, what I can also do is in debugging, what's really nice if I have at some position in my code, um, I would have an error, like here I have my zero division error. Now if I run through it, well, there's nothing I can do, my program exited. However, when I debug, there's something really nice and that's post-mortem debugging. So if I click here and view my breakpoints or hit Control shift f 8 I would see my breakpoints here. So I have one normal line breakpoint and that's this one at line 71. But I can also enable post-mortem debugging. So I can make my debugger stop at any exception. And that's really nice because that's post-mortem debugging. So now it's stopped here. So Actually, my program is dead, so it told me here I have an exception breakpoint, but I can still do my postmortem debugging. So basically what this does is basically twice every single line and it accepts does what I just did here. Okay, and now I could go through my code, evaluate expression, and check why did I have this error. So this is why how I would then, so this is, um, how it would work in any kind of project. So if I have unknown errors and I don't want the program to crash at these errors, especially if it's running for a long time, then I can simply activate post-mortem debugging by control shift F8 and then simply making an exception breakpoint for any kind of Python exception. And that then will, well, even though it crashed, make me able, make me, allow me to um, still look at what went wrong here. So it even, it gave me this exception even before and I can look at my exception and still try to debug the exception even though I already had it. So now I hope this big example showed you of why the debugger is useful and what it can, like, it, why it can do stuff that I normally can't do. But let me go back to um, a small example again. So, Where's my debug simple? There it is. Okay, so imagine I had this program, I had some kind of list, and I would go, I would loop over this list, not elegant of course, but then I would check if for some position of this list where the index is the same, the index is the same as the value. And if so, I'm gonna print it. Okay, so now let me run this. I would see it doesn't print. So now, hmm. Why doesn't it print? Well, <clears throat> let's figure that out. So what I would do is I would make a breakpoint inside this if condition to see if this breakpoint is ever reached. So I told you that I don't like prints to see if you reach some if condition because you can simply make a breakpoint inside this. And do I, ever re do I ever reach this? No, apparently I do not. Okay, so I don't reach this. So let me make a breakpoint here to see what, what's going wrong here? So imagine I, this is coming from somewhere else and I don't know that I actually wrote 55 here instead of five. Okay, so now, okay, here my index is zero and well, I can even make a new variable test value at the position i. And now I look and it's 10. So now that's wrong. So now it's one and nine. So it's not supposed to, it's not supposed to, it's not supposed to. Now, if I had a really long array, it would take me forever to click through this loop because for, and this is what I would have if I had prints right here, right? If I would print test value at the position I here and I, then I would print it 10 times. And this was 10,000 elements long, I would print it 10,000 times. But what I can also do is I can make a conditional breakpoint. For a conditional breakpoint, I can right click my breakpoint and here test for some condition. So for example, I equals five. If I only want to see the fifth one, I think actually, uh, so let, let it, let, it, let this breakpoint be at four. Now it only goes into the breakpoint once I is four. 
And now I can, well, step forward, step forward, and now I'm at the position where I wanted to be. And now I see, ah, I is 55, not 5. Now that must be an error. And then, perfect, I can remove it, and now I can run my program, and I see, well, first of all, I still have the breakpoint, I can simply remove it. Now I see, hmm, okay, it got here, so that's already good, but it still crashes. Why? I don't know. But I do know, post-mortem debugging can only concatenate string to string. Ah, so apparently this here is wrong, so let me execute it here, and yeah, type error. So, can I convert this here to a string? Yes, I can. The result is nothing but print we printed this here to the normal terminal. So I can now replace the line with this. And now it should work. For now, debug it. It runs through and finds the value where the, where the index is the same as the value and it worked. Okay, so I've showed you PyCharm now. There's nothing here because I showed you in PyCharm. And I also showed you how to debug in PyCharm. So we've seen breakpoints, the variable explorer, that you can navigate the call stack, you can make conditional breakpoints, you can evaluate expressions, you can go for post-mortem debugging, and I even showed you the profiler. Now, since March, there's the possibility to do professional visual debugging in JupyterLab. And that's awesome. So first of all, we need to upgrade quite a lot. So we need to install the debugger extension here. It's, so far, it's only a JupyterLab extension. And for that, we need to update our Jupyter Lab to version 2. So this is the script. You're also going to see it in the root of your lectures repository under um, post build debug. And if you run all of this, hopefully it works. And then you uh, then you upgraded your Jupyter Lab. And now in this upgraded Jupyter Lab, we see that now we can add, for example, XPython notebooks. And now the thing is, that XPython is another kernel for JuPyter. So, so far we only had the normal Python 3 and Python 2 kernel. And XPython is simply another implementation of the backend. Doesn't matter for you, you only need to know only those XPython files um, can be debugged. Only those XPython um, JuPyter notebooks. And to switch, we can simply, once we installed everything successfully, we can simply switch from a normal Python kernel here to an XPython kernel. And now we see I can enable debugging once I installed all of this. So now that I'm enabling debugging, now I see that for all of my cells here, I can add breakpoints. That's really nice. So let's do that here. Let's make a breakpoint here. And now let's execute this. And now we see I'm actually, I set a breakpoint. So I'm stopping execution at this line. Now, if I open my debugger tab here, I have the same thing as I had my PyCharm debugger. I have the variable explorer. I have the call stack, which I can go through. So in my module, I use the add function. And now I'm inside this x function, add function in line 3. I have my breakpoints. So this here is the list of breakpoints. I only have one, and that's somewhere here. So this simply means somewhere in this cell. So this is the interpretation of the cell. And I have the original source. So even if I now delete it, the original cell, it would still know where I am. And just as I navigated through this in PyCharm, I can navigate through this in JupyterLab. 